Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Hello, I'm Stephen McKnight, producer for Main Street, Wyoming. On this edition of Main Street, we seek to find what's in a name. To find the answer, we'll start by sitting down with Dr. Phil Roberts from the University of Wyoming. He'll talk about the history of assigning and chronicling the unique name derivations of Wyoming. Later on in the show, we'll visit a couple of places with some of those unique Wyoming names. It's all next on Main Street, Wyoming. Production funding for Main Street, Wyoming is provided in part by the Wheeler Family Foundation of Casper and by the members of Wyoming PBS. Thank you. When chronicling names in, in Wyoming, it goes all the way back, probably you could go even further back than statehood. You could probably go all the way back to John Colder who came into Wyoming in the winter of 1807 and 1808 and wandered around through the northwest part of Wyoming, including Yellowstone Park. But when he returned to St. Louis later that year, he encountered William Clark, who had been his old employer on the Lewis and Clark expedition. And Clark sat uh, John Colder down and asked him to describe the territory that he'd explored. And Clark put it on the map. And then together, they came up with some names for some of the rivers and streams and mountains and some of the natural features that uh, continue to be named that to this day. Often these explorers uh, name these places either for themselves or their friends. We have an awful lot of stuff named for John C. Fremont, Fremont Peak, Fremont County, Pathfinder Reservoir. Pathfinder is the nickname of John C. Fremont, so you might say that that's a name for Fremont. And a lot of that is because he not only was an explorer, but he sent in a report to Congress about what he'd found and also provided maps. If you're a person doing the mapping and doing the exploring and you're the first one there, you have a pretty, pretty open opportunity to name things as you wish. And then, of course, there are a number of features that were named by the uh, early explorers after Indians. And one of the best examples of that is uh, Togedi Pass, named for one of the last members of the sheep eater group of Indians. Togedi was a guide for the army expeditions up in that area, and uh, the army applied the name to the pass. Occasionally, other individuals would interview people, particularly old pioneers, native people sometimes, and try to come up with derivations of where some of these names might have come from. One of these guys was G.C. Coutant, who uh, wrote a history of Wyoming, taking Wyoming up to roughly the territorial period. But among the things that he was asking people was, uh, how various features got their names, and we can find those as footnotes in his, his work. The next set of names started being chronicled in the uh, very earliest days of Wyoming statehood when a state historian by the name of Robert Morris started compiling some derivations of Wyoming names, and he published a few of them, but he also kept them in manuscript form in the newly created State Historical Department. There are then a series of articles that appeared in what's now Annals of Wyoming, but was at one time called the Quarterly Bulletin. A lot of those articles were simply little fillers. At the end of a longer article, there'd be a few inches of space at the end, and so the editor would just simply put in a number of names and the derivations of where those particular names came from. And all the way up to about 1942 or 43, they were still doing that in, in annals. A couple of places that got named for government officials, one of them is Hudson, that was named for a game warden, and that's always nice. 
So a few of those places pop up. And then we have a few other towns that came into existence because of the railroad. It was largely up to the railroad to name the location. So a very good example is a town along the line of the uh, Burlington Railroad that gained its name from one of the surveyors, a guy by the name of Edward Gillette. It was so named by the railroad to honor Gillette for doing such a nice job in lining up the rail line through uh, that part of Wyoming. And there are several others that uh, take their names from cattle brands. We have uh, U-Cross, JM, named for the James Moore brand, KC, up in uh, northern part of Wyoming. And that's an unusual characteristic that you probably won't find anywhere east of here to have a town name for a brand. There are a number of others that were named simply because of the natural resources nearby reminded people of other places. One of the best examples is Newcastle. And of course, Newcastle in England is a big mining, coal mining town. So uh, naturally, if you're gonna find a big coal mine, then you can name the town Newcastle and people get the idea, oh, okay, there must be a lot of coal nearby. There were a couple of people then who took it up as a, more or less their mission to compile names of Wyoming. Uh, D. Linford, who worked for the Game and Fish Department, compiled stream names and published a book called Wyoming Stream Names. About the same time, Mayor Bannock, a rancher in the Nybra County area north of Lusk, started compiling her Wyoming place names that by the end of the 1980s was the standard reference for, for derivations of Wyoming names. And she started with a lot of the, the names from the, the record, from Annals, and from the Quarterly Bulletin, and from Robert Morris's work, and, and even as far back as, uh, as the Coutant materials. And, uh, and then she and her husband, Jerry, traveled around Wyoming and collected additional names and spent lots of time at the microfilm readers over in the state archives and ferreting out names from old newspapers. There seems to be a very strong connection in Wyoming between journalists and history, particularly with respect to collecting such important things as the origins of place names. Hello, welcome to Chugwater. Here, Don Hodson will share his knowledge of the history of the area talk about growing up here in the 50s, and tell us how its distinctive name came to be. Chugwater's uh, history really reaches back to the ranching era. Uh, in particular, it reaches back to the great uh, Swan Land and Cattle Company, put together by Alex Swan with Scottish money, or close to $3 million, capitalized in that company. And this soon became, in 1884, it became the headquarters for the Swan Land and Cattle Company. As it added property, the Swan becomes a history in itself, and it extends itself and grows. And the result is that that's really kind of the genesis of, of Chugwater, and if you talk about Wyoming as being a child of the Union Pacific, I think you'd say in a sense that Chugwater is, is a child of the Swan Land and Cattle Company. It was surveyed in about 1886, and then in 1887, it became then officially a, a community of Chugwater. And the importance there were two things. The railroad from Cheyenne, it was called the Cheyenne Northern at the time, then also with the headquarters of the Swan Company being located here in this particular area, the railroad and the Swan Company decided that they would plat a town. And so the town then was laid out, recognized as a community, lots were sold. Now, later on, when a town does begin to form with businesses and buildings, they replat the town. But this time it was planted on the west side of the railroad. And then it begins really to take off. I think that a lot of small towns uh, across Wyoming are close to ranching and farming growth. Chugwater is almost kind of on an equal basis because pretty much everything then to the west of Chugwater is ranching, uh, particularly along uh, Chugwater or Chug Creek as we call it. All the way up along you have a whole series of wonderful old time uh, historic ranches uh, that, that are there. Particularly uh, what you need are you need the streams, 
to provide the meadow lands and to, for water. And they also find that the grasses are nutritious and cattle can sustain to it. And the winters, while they can be severe, you can also have mild winters. And thus beginning in by the 1870s, there's an early beginning of, of cattle ranching flourishing. On the other hand, when you go uh, east out of Chugwater, it predominantly is, is farming and it's dry land. It begins then in those early years of, after 1908. They uh, brought what farming equipment they had and they got off of Chugwater and there was a fellow by the name of Porter who would show them where they could file a homestead. But if you looked out here on the flats, the Iowa Center flats, Chugwater flats, in the uh, teens and in the 20s, uh, there were farms all over. And in the boom years for the, for the town are in those years up into the 1920s. And it's a, large numbers of people are, are coming in mainly to Homestead. There is a town, but there's also a community of Chugwater. And so if you reach out in a radius of about 25 miles from Chugwater, you have early uh, beginnings of, of small settlements. And all around Chugwater, you have a community. In 1910, you probably only had about 50 people in, in the community. By 1920, the census is uh, 318, 318 people. Since that time, there has never been as many people in Chugwater as there was in the 1920 census. And probably by about 1920, you have probably uh, close to maybe 15 or 20 businesses. And then it follows the, the years into the Depression, dry years of the 30s, and then into the World War II. Then a, a kind of a revival, a renewal of the town occurs in the uh, 1950s. The World War II veterans are returning. There's a, there's a kind of a new lease on life. Uh, I was growing up, for example, in Chugwater in the 1950s. And uh, my gosh, we had uh, two grocery stores. Uh, we had five filling stations because Highway 87 was the only highway and that was Main Street. And so you had filling stations, you had uh, cafes. Chugwater Bank, which has always existed back to about 1912, a couple implement dealerships, and, and people could still shop and get pretty much what they needed or wanted in Chugwater. And so all these outlying communities uh, established had trade with, with Chugwater. It's a pretty impressive um, small town that's operating, and of course there's a lot of travel coming through. It soon changes, however, because with the coming of Interstate 25 north from Cheyenne, uh, things begin to change. And then we move into a period then in which there's a certain amount of anxiety. Land is being consolidated. People have been moving off the flats. And so life begins to change through those years up into the 21st century. One of the other things, in 1969, uh, the school burns down. So what does a community do? Do we rebuild the school or do we bus our students into Wheatland? And that brings a lot of hard feelings. What is it once a community that is pretty well within itself suddenly finds itself in conflict? That's resolved and finally they decide to build. Most people today, if you mention you're from Chugwater, oh, that's where Chugwater Chelly comes from. Well, Chugwater Chile is a, a, it was, was actually comes uh, about because a man in Cheyenne uh, is pretty successful uh, with his chili, uh, going to chili cook-offs, and decided at some point that he, he needed a, a more catchy name. And so he started without any uh, consultation with the town council, as I understand it, or he started then uh, using the name Chugwater Chile. Well, he was still successful. And so in about 1985 or 86, five families go together and buy uh, the rights to the recipe and the name. A year after these five families had purchased uh, the recipe, what's really a seasoning, it's, it's not the, the chili soup itself, but it's a seasoning, uh, they started the Chugwater Shelly Cook-Off, and it is the state championship which uh, brings in anywhere from maybe 1,000 to 1,500 people uh, in this small town. It's a full day of, of celebration and bands and all kinds of things going on and games and people can taste the chili and, and vote for who they think has the best chili.
despite the fact that Chugwater does not have a, a U.S. senator or a governor, people of that sort of fame, it does claim Steamboat, the horse. A lot of people think that Steamboat was the horse that was drawn for the license plate, but nobody is sure that that, that, that occurred. But Steamboat did become a famous bucking horse. And Chugwater's uh, claim to fame, if you will, it was the place, the beginning of, of Steamboat. So. One of the things you say, well, what's in a name of Chugwater? And that's, that's interesting in itself because it is an attractive name. It catches people. In fact, uh, when I went off to college, uh, students would ask me, where are you from, Hudson? And I'd say, well, Chugwater. And I knew what was coming next. Well, how did it get its name? And I would relate the story, and then they would say, Hudson, you're putting us on. Uh, the story probably comes through from various early trappers talking to Indians, and presumably a Mandan chief who uh, was disabled and could not uh, lead the buffalo hunt for that year, whenever. And he convinced his son, who anglicized name would have been the dreamer, to take over leadership of hunting buffalo. And the son evidently dilly-dallied around, and he was presumably a dreamer, uh, too lazy to do it, whatever, but evidently come up with the idea, let's go out and surround the buffalo and let's then decoy them, get them to go over the cliffs. Now Chugwater is, is located in a valley with a stream running through it. And hence the Indians then hearing the chugging of the buffalo as they hit below uh, these cliffs, they would hit and made it, in their language, made a chugging sound. And so they named the stream the water where the buffalo chug. They passed that story, I presume, to the mountain men, and, and in terms of people like uh, Jim Bridger or, or others, uh, it became then, that was the naming of the streams, and a town takes its name from Chug Water. In a small community, you get to know everybody. Even in your school, you have one school that houses all students from K through 12. You know all of those students. You know every teacher. And so you have that closeness, that togetherness that small towns afford. I think another thing that, that even still draws me to Chugwater today is it's, uh, it's, it's beauty. You know, we could go up in the, in the bluffs and hike and wade in the creek. In five minutes, you're outside of town. You're out in the country, really close to nature. It was a great place to grow up, and I have, I have really a deep uh, affection for Chugwater, and I think most of us who grew up in Chugwater really are appreciative of the fact that we did grow up here. As a historian and encampment native, Candy Moulton literally wrote the book about the history of the Grand Encampment area. She'll share with us some of that history and what makes encampment so special. Encampment got its name when the fur trappers came here in the early 1800s. They started trapping all across the West. They held a little camp here. They called it Camp La Grande in 1838. It was shortly after the bigger rendezvous that year that was held up on the Papoja. And they called it Camp La Grande. That kind of evolved into the Grand Encampment and they call that, this area, the Grand Encampment for many years. When the town came about decades later, they named it Grand Encampment and is actually incorporated as Grand Encampment and is still Grand Encampment in spite of the fact that the U.S. Postal Service says we have to only be encampment. The Grand Encampment area developed because of a way for people to get from point A to point B. When the Arapahoes went through here, they traveled from up in northern Wyoming and central Wyoming down into Estes Park, Colorado area a lot. And so transportation has always been important here with the trails. The, the earliest people who were in the encampment area who were not Native American were the fur trappers and the explorers. So we have direct connections to um, some of the iconic names of the West. We know Kit Carson was here. He brought John C. Fremont through here in 1844. We know that Jim Baker was here. He um, has really direct ties on the West side over on the little Snake River Valley. But he was here, Jim Bridger was here. All of those early mountain men were here. The actual earliest community right in this area within you know a mile and a half or so of here it was the town of Swan. 
which was downstream from Doggett or Riverside, and it was started by the Swan um, family originally, and the Swan family is really known, the name, in the state of Wyoming because of the large um, Swan Land and Cattle Company. The Swan brothers who came here, there were four of them who came here, they were related to Alexander B. Swan who had the Swan Land and Cattle Company, and they had a post office there, and they called it Swan. In the 1879-1880 period, the first homesteaders came in here and claimed land. And they started raising cattle and crops. Some, some later raised some sheep, um, crops being mainly hay, some wheat, but that was dry land wheat and not a lot of that. So agriculture has always been the mainstay of this valley. It's still the predominant industry in our area today. But during the 1897 um, to 198 period, we were known for our copper district. It was the copper district of the era. People who came here came from Cripple Creek, Colorado, and the mining opportunities there were starting to dwindle, and miners always go to the next big strike, and they came here. One of the most unique features of the Grand Encampment Copper District was the way that they actually transported the ore. Initially, they hauled it by wagons. That was very hard. The Ferris Haggerty Mine was on the west side of the Continental Divide, 16 miles from the encampment, and the smelter that was established right near the Encampment River. So they came up with the idea to, to build an aerial tramway. It was 16 miles long, crossed the Continental Divide, had 270 ore buckets. It was a massive undertaking. It was built in 1902-1903 in the wintertime in an area where the snow is extremely deep. The key to mining was to get the ore to markets. There's no market here. So they hauled it in freight wagons. They hauled it um, in summer and winter. They hauled it in an aerial tramway. All the time, all they really wanted was a railroad. The railway came to encampment after the boom had already died. They had fires at the smelter, and they didn't rebuild because the price of copper had dropped. So we got our railway too late to benefit the mines at all. So the railway benefited the ranchers who then used it for shipping their cattle and their, and their sheep out of here for many years until 1974. Everyone thinks of Grand Encampment as the Copper District era. But really, at the same time, we had tie hacks here. We had as many tie hacks working in the mountains as we did miners. They were originally cut ties for the Union Pacific. Later, they cut ties that were used in our own um, Saratoga Encampment Railway and the railway that came from Walcott down to Saratoga, plus to support the Union Pacific. They would cut these ties in the mountains. They would deck them up in the winter time, in the spring when the snow melt started running and the streams were high. They'd kick the ties into the streams and float them down to Fort Steele where they put them on the railroad. In 1902, we had about 3,000 people living here. That's sort of hard to imagine. It's so quiet in the encampment now, but back then, it was a very busy place. There were miners in the hills, there were tie hacks in the hills, there were ranchers out doing their, their work, there were businessmen, we had electricity, we had running water, we had all the amenities. Charles E. Winter was a newspaper editor here with the Grand Encampment Herald during the mining boom era. He left um, here for a while and he went back to Pennsylvania on a visit and he became very homesick for Wyoming. And while he was in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania, he wrote the words that became the Wyoming State Song. And then he came home and the music for the song was also written by a local man here in Encampment. So we proudly claim that we are the birthplace of the Wyoming State Song. Wyoming, Wyoming, land of the sunlight clear. Laura Webb Nichols' family came in here in the 1879 period. They were among the earliest homesteaders, the Nichols family. As a young girl, she was, you know, 12 or 14 years old. She got a camera for her birthday and she started taking photographs. She took photographs the rest of her life and she documented the history of the people and the activities of our community in a way that no one else 
has ever done nor ever will do because it was over like 70 years of, of documentation, about 20,000 negatives. She gives us a wonderful, wonderful glimpse into what our community story is. The Graham Encampment Museum is 50 years old this year and we're very proud of that. It was started by two local women who one day said, we ought to start collecting some of this stuff and this is what they collected. <laughs> it's uh, quite, a, quite an operation that we have now. We have um, moved in 17 different structures from a variety of places. We have one cabin, the oldest cabin out of Saratoga. We have the Slash Ridge Fire Tower. We have an original homestead um, house that was the Perriam family, one of the early homestead families here, and businesses that were from various locations. We have at the museum in the 1970s we moved in three original tram towers that came from up on the line. The original moved in by the Lions Club and then we redid it. It is an icon for the community. Everyone knows that's encampment if you see a picture. The other iconic structure that we have here is our two-story outhouse and we built that as a replica in 1976 for the bicentennial of of America and the reason you have an, a two-story outhouse is the sounds kind of crazy but the snow got so deep in the winter up in the mountains that you couldn't get to the bottom floor so you would get to the top floor easier and so the seat on the bottom floor of the outhouse tips up so in the winter time you use the top floor and allegedly everything just goes with gravity down so our tramway and our two-story outhouse are our two uh, two are really iconic features uh, not many museums have a fire lookout tower though, so we're quite proud of the Slash Ridge Tower that came off of the Snowy Range. And it's the best view of the town of Encampment today is to climb the tower. From our boom days, Encampment uh, dwindled quickly down to four or five hundred people and it's held steady at about four or five hundred people ever since probably 1910. The mainstay economy is agriculture. We have a lot of people who live here who work elsewhere. They commute because it's a beautiful community. Our greatest feature is our mountains right to the west. We have a lot of public land. We have four wilderness areas that are right nearby. So people come here to enjoy the outdoors and to recreate. We don't have any stoplights. We barely have one paved street, but we have friendly people and we have a lot of events that go on annually that really give people a variety of things to do. The future of encampment is probably much like the past. This is, this is a community that's going to endure. We don't have a lot of businesses, but we have some good businesses. We have um, a good school and we have our ranching community that's not going to go away. So we're probably not going to change a lot. Uh, you won't find a lot of big fancy nightlife or anything like that, but you will find a place where you can reconnect with nature. We hope you've enjoyed this What's in a Name edition of Main Street, Wyoming. If there are other unique names in Wyoming you'd like to see explored or have other ideas for Main Street, please send us an email at MainStreetWyoming at wyomingpbs.org. Thank you. Production funding for Main Street, Wyoming is provided in part by the Wheeler Family Foundation of Casper and by the members of Wyoming PBS. Thank you.